Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Brian asked me to step in and do the CROI update for HIV prevention, and so I looked through some of the posters and listened to the webcasts, which are now live as of yesterday. And I just wanted to give you a snapshot or quick run through of a few abstracts and talks that I thought were the most interesting. This is my typical disclosure. I attended that one advisory meeting in 2018, and then we may talk about things that are not currently FDA approved. So just what are we going to talk about? The posters and talks that I have up here focus on HIV testing, the development of drug resistance, urine tenofovir testing for monitoring adherence, some interesting findings about non-daily use, and then some broader uh, thoughts about how we are targeting PrEP. What you do not see on here is anything about uh, cabotegravir or anything really new about other medicines. I am sparing you some of the talks about the DISCOVER trial. There's more data presented here, but since I did a talk about that last week, uh, and there was nothing new presented, it was just information that was shared with the FDA, so nothing really new there. Um, I didn't focus on that. So the first abstract I want to share with you was a oral abstract titled Initiating PrEP During Acute HIV Infection, What is the Risk for Antiretroviral Drug Resistance? So we all know that one of the greatest risks for drug resistance in PrEP is people who start after they got recently infected. And the Thai Red Cross, as part of RV254 and SEARCH10, which is this Thai study which has devoted a huge amount of resources towards identifying and characterizing acute HIV is a really great place to look at this question. So a few years ago, uh, the Thai Red Cross started offering PrEP and all of their HIV testing as part of PrEP starts and ongoing PrEP is being provided by the RV254 search study. So everyone is getting tested by a rapid point of care test at the start and then followed by a pooled qualitative a yes, no test. And so in their 2,442 PrEP starts over a couple of years, they identified seven people who started PrEP during acute HIV infection. Five were identified by pooled NAT in the specimen that was drawn at the time of PrEP start, and two additional folks had negative pools but tested antibody positive at a one-month follow-up visit. And these two individuals, when they get, went back to their baseline specimens, had viral loads under 100 copies. They're using pools of 10 to 20, so not surprising that those low-level RNA, those low-level viral loads might have been missed even with small pools. And they looked at these seven individuals, and three of the seven had M184I or M184V detected at follow-up, um, and they compared that to the rest of their acute infection cohort in which they haven't identified any M184I or V and said that this suggests, and I'll, I'll qualify that more than they did, this suggests that these were acquired from PrEP and not transmitted resistance mutations. Four of the seven had no resistance despite being on PrEP two to 15 days. And then you can see the rest of the classes of mutations, and there was only one NNRTI mutation that was detected, which is of course not part of the PrEP regimen. And the figure that I'm showing down here is just those seven people who acquired uh, HIV and started PrEP and whether or not they had drug resistance or not. And this is really nice suggestion that you can be on two drug therapy for up to 15 days. In the green are the number of days that people were on. So at the bottom, people were on two uh, PrEP for two days, two days, seven days, and 15 days before their detection was noted. And then 29, 35, and I can't read what the larger number is on my slide uh, right now because of the way my set, I'm set up. But anyway, so, so it looks really nicely split between if you were only on PrEP for 15 days that you didn't develop drug resistance, and if you were on PrEP for 29 days or longer, that you were at greater risk. They, interestingly, which we can talk about at the end, since 2019 have decided that the risk of drug resistance among people who are starting with acute infection, even doing the best of screening 
unless you're gonna do individual viral loads, that that's too high. And so what this program has done is that if any individual who is about to start PrEP reports any, and they're putting quotes, high risk behavior within the last 30 days, they actually start three drugs until the person comes back for one month and then pair back to two drugs. Again, we can talk about whether this is the right thing or not. I'm gonna share with you another abstract. This came out of the uh, University of California, San Francisco Treat Acute HIV Study where they are also trying to identify and get um, patients recruited and referred to them with acute HIV infection. And they define this thing called HIV PrEP overlap, where people uh, started PrEP during acute HIV or some people who were on PrEP and acquired HIV. And they had 11 of their 58 enrollees had some degree of HIV PrEP overlap, five who had um, acute infection when they started PrEP and six who acquired HIV while on PrEP. Their oral abstract basically just identifies three cases that they want to uh, sort of just illustrate as how there are, as their title says, diagnostic and therapeutic challenges when people are on PrEP in an early infection. The first case they describe is someone who uh, had acute infection and then started PrEP and then developed a M184I at day seven. And they believe it was developed because they went back to that day zero at the time of PrEP start and the person had a, had a virus that could be identified and it was a wild type virus. Whether or not it was, uh, there was a minority M184 is unclear, but that unfortunately goes back to the abstract I just presented that suggests that even by day seven that resistance might develop. Number three, the case that, that I just want to talk about briefly is someone who um, had been on PrEP, stopped PrEP, had sex while not receiving any medications and then two days later went on Truvada as PAP and then came in for testing and was HIV positive. And it just, they go through and they illustrate how the testing can be complicated. I wanna go into more detail about case number two that they present because they describe this as a case where PrEP can be overwhelmed, similar to the Amsterdam patient that was described a couple of years ago. This person had been on PrEP for quite a while they had last tested for HIV three months prior to their positive test. And about one month prior to their test, they went on a binge and reported 45 partners within a week or two period. When they came in for a regular visit, they had a positive antibody antigen test, negative supplemental testing, i.e. genius, a positive qualitative test. They came back for follow-up one week later, again, had a positive antibody antigen test, a negative supplemental test, a positive qualitative RNA, but a negative quantitative plasma RNA. So just illustrating that sometimes this isn't totally clear. They went on three drugs, antiretroviral therapy, and at that point, zero reverted, meaning their positive test that they had had went back to negative. But when they did some studies of the PBMCs, they identified HIV there. And so HIV infection was clearly confirmed. This person will have some diagnostic challenges if ever they need to document their HIV status. But I just bring this up as a reinforcement of what we've talked about previously, that testing someone for HIV infection while they were on PrEP may not always be clear and sometimes you have to do additional testing and sometimes you may decide to stop PrEP until it actually all becomes more clear to you. The next two slides are going to talk about urine tenofovir testing for adherence monitoring. This was Matt Stinelli from UCSF, also an oral presentation that was abstract 91, but there's other work done on this. We've talked about this a little bit before. And I wanna bring this to you again, just because I think this is moving into real time. So the title of this abstract was the near perfect accuracy of a real time urine tenofovir test compared to lab based ELISAs. They used samples from Partners Prep, which we've talked about was based out of here, which was discordant couples. They used 454 urine samples from 297 participants. And the iBreathe study, which is out of UCSF, which we've also talked about, which is doing PK work in transgender men and transgender women on PrEP. And there were 46 transgender men and women and 231 samples. The test looks exactly like a pregnancy test. The test that you can see on the upper right of that slide is their actual test. And it works just like a pregnancy test. They are comparing this urine test with a ELISA, 
that has a limit of detection of a thousand nanograms per mil. And this device was developed for this point of care test to detect anything with 1500 nanograms per mil. And the reason for that is to make it so that 98% of tests will be positive if the participant took a dose within the last 24 hours and 98% of the test will be negative if the person did not take any doses within 120 hours, which is five days. And one of the reasons for this, and you can read it from Monica Gandhi's paper from last year, was that participants, at least in Africa, who were asked, didn't want to have a negative test when they know they'd taken it. So it's geared towards detecting any test, any PrEP intake if someone has taken it within um, the last five days. And one of the things we can talk about again, and Dave Hatchie, I might ask you to step in more uh, in thinking about PK related to this, is these are all markers of tenofovir level. Plasma and urine are all markers of recent PrEP intake, and that people are working on markers for longer term adherence, sort of like the hemoglobin A1C and monitoring for diabetes. So the results on the next slide show that this device works very, very well. What you can see on the figure are people who tested negative by the point of care device and all of them had a tenofovir level under 1500 nanograms per mil as measured by the lab-based ELISA. Of those who were positive, um, three had levels measured below 1500, but the, the vast majority were uh, met positive criteria by the comparator test. So this gave a sensitivity of 100%, a specificity of 98%, an accuracy of 99.6%. And this device is moving forward into research trials. And is my understanding from the presentation is that they're actually moving forward in large-scale manufacturing of this. There's additional work that needs to be done in terms of how this gets implemented in both PrEP and in treatment. But one of the things that's coming forward is that these point-of-care devices can predict virologic failure as well as HIV acquisition. So we may start actually using them. There are other devices that are also in sort of this early production phase. Uh, just a very quick poster that looked at non-daily use of HIV PrEP in a large online sample in the United States. This was an online survey of almost 10,000 men of sex with men who were recruited from sexual networking sites. Of the 33%, and i sorry, I didn't calculate that out, who reported taking PrEP within the last six months, 5% of them reported non-daily use. And what the poster table that I have um, copied in there shows you is how uh, this non-daily use was reported. And unfortunately, it doesn't break it down into what might be appropriate and what isn't appropriate non-daily use. But again, 5% of our active PrEP users may be doing something that is not daily. The majority of this is PrEP around the time of sex, of which some of this is appropriate to one one dosing, which has been studied, though not uh, currently approved in the United States. But other people reported just taking a single, day, a single pill a day before and one day after and some reported just a pill on the day of sex. Other people, about a quarter, reported that they were taking PrEP on some regular schedule that wasn't daily PrEP, including the TNS schedule, which I'd never heard before, but that is uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. Some taking it every other day, some taking it just on weekends. And then uh, you can see sort of some of the other stuff. And so this is just the first that I've seen of sort of, we know that it's happening, that some of our patients, I'm, at, I'm prescribing to women, but I know that other people are doing it. And we just need to make sure that people understand exactly how they should be doing non-daily dosing so that they are protected. I've got just two more that I thought was interesting. This one I just want to run through quickly. This is a presentation, a poster from the company on the impact of PrEP and treatment as prevention on incidence of HIV diagnosis in the 58 highest burden U.S. areas. This map shows where those areas are. I think the only one that's sort of relevant to Mountain West is King County. Um, but the thing I thought was really interesting, so, you know, as an aside, I'm going to tell you that their calculations, which weren't well illustrated, suggest that PrEP use uh, independently decreases HIV incidence. Again, they're estimated that if you can get it to 17 uh, persons at risk out of 100, that you can decrease incidence by 15%. I think that's interesting, but again, I don't know enough about how they calculated that. But what I thought was really interesting is you can see on this figures the um, ending the HIV epidemic areas are in green, everywhere else is in brown. You can see on the left 
that the ending the HIV uh, locations have a higher HIV incidence. This isn't surprising. That's why they're um, ending the HIV epidemic. I need to, that's too long. Ending the HIV epidemic regions and that everybody has seen a slight decrease over the last few years, probably do a variety of different factors. What I thought was really interesting is that um, on the two figures on the right, again, the in the green is the ending the HIV epidemic groups, is that fewer people are on PrEP and fewer people are suppressed in those regions. And there are probably other factors, obviously, that are associated, but it's one reason, one suggestion of this is the reason why we need to be devoting additional resources, but also there are already additional resources in these areas and we should be doing better. That's mostly what I wanted to share about that. The we should be doing better is going to translate over to the, my final abstract that I wanted to share with you, which is the development of a PrEP equity index to set local targets for PrEP coverage. And this is work that was done out of New York City that was trying to quantify how much extra work we should be doing to try and address disparities. We all know this. Disparities are driven uh, in HIV are both just driven by disparities in access and also increased HIV burden in different populations. And so what they did was um, develop these new metrics called PrEP coverage, which is your PrEP use as measured in, in this by a sexual health survey or by NHBS, divided by the need, which is the new HIV diagnoses by race, ethnicity. And they created this PrEP equity index and looked at what PrEP coverage is for white men divided by PrEP coverage for uh, Black or Latino men who have sex with men. And why they did it in this direction, not the other, I don't know, but that's why you are going to get numbers greater than one for these PrEP equity indices. So what they estimated was the PrEP equity index for Black MSM range, depending on how they, how they quantify these, range from 1.7 to 3.9, and for Latinx folks, it was 2 to 3. The targeted increase in PrEP that needed to reverse these disparities for black men was to increase PrEP uptake and persistence by between 65 and 295 percent and by Latinx, for Latinx folks, by 131 to 235 percent. And they said, these are extremely ambitious, but just this gives us a metric of why we need to be doing better. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.